holiday season, less merry and bright as COVID-19 continues to hammer the U.S. as new strains emerge overseas. Joining us now, Admiral Brett Giroir, a member of the White House Coronavirus Task Force. Admiral, welcome to Fox News Sunday. Great to be here. Thank you for having me on. TSA checkpoint travel numbers reveal more than one million per day traveling leading up to Christmas despite those COVID warnings. Do you expect a spike in new cases as a result, sir? Well, it really depends on what the travelers do when they get where they're going. We know the actual physical act of traveling uh, in airplanes, for example, can be quite safe because of the air purification systems. What we really worry about is the mingling of different bubbles once you get to your destination. Over Thanksgiving, we saw a mixed picture. In the Midwest and in the Northern Plains, uh, cases continued to go down despite the travel, which meant that people really uh, did the kinds of things we talked to them about, like wearing a mask and limiting your gathering. So we really have to wait and see. I really encourage people to follow the CDC guidelines, make your family gatherings small, safe, protect the elderly, and we can get through this. There are concerns about a new variant or mutations of the virus in places like the United Kingdom, Japan, even Canada. Ontario's chief medical officer announced Saturday that they had confirmed two cases there. Considering global travel, do you think this new strain is now here in the United States? Well, we don't know if it's here or not. Uh, we would say that there's certainly a possibility that it's here already because of global travel and it's in so many countries now. Let me tell you what we know about the strain. Um, it is, uh, number one, it is not any more serious than the normal strains of COVID. However, it does appear to be more transmissible. There's not direct evidence of that, but there's lots of suggestive evidence. But again, you can still protect yourself by the mitigation measures. And we have no evidence to suggest, nor do we believe, that this vaccine, that the vaccine uh, would not be effective. In other words, we do believe the vaccine will be effective against this variant. So that's why we're you know, so excited and still very enthusiastic about the vaccine program, which is being rolled out on time, on schedule, uh, with almost 15 and a half million doses being distributed by this week upcoming. The United States is requiring negative tests from travelers coming from the United Kingdom. Do we need that elsewhere? Is that enough at this point? So um, I think what's often uh, not talked about is since March, there's been a very substantial travel restriction on UK and a variety of countries from, from Europe. So since March, we have had a decrease of 90 to 95 percent of travelers coming from the UK, which mm -hmm. is our first line of defense, which other countries did not have. The added testing puts an extra layer, and that's very important. There's no perfect silver bullet, but a test three days before. Now, the CDC can't order testing once you're in states after that, but we would certainly encourage states to have quarantine orders or to have testing once these uh, travelers arise. So 95% decrease already. The extra testing puts another barrier, and the states could also impose things. So I think we're going to be pretty safe with these um, as, again, we roll out vaccines, which are going to be highly effective against all the strains that are out there. To those COVID vaccines, we've seen first responders, some high-profile politicians rolling up their sleeves. Who's next in line to receive the shots? Well, in the first wave, it has uh, really been our healthcare workers and those in nursing homes. Uh, the next wave is going to be different by state. The general recommendations are those over 75 and certain frontline workers, but it's going to vary state by state. Uh, let me talk about Governor Abbott in Texas. Mm -hmm. He really is going to prioritize anyone over 65 because those are the people who go to the hospitals. It's not the frontline 24-year-old worker who is at low risk of getting the infection and at very, very low risk of getting uh, serious results from that. But over 65, yes, that's who's in the hospital and certain other people like cancer patients or people with sickle cell disease. Governor DeSantis in Florida uh, is prioritizing everyone over 70. So I think you're going to see variability. And I think that variability is critically important because as the hospitals fill up, the first priority really needs to be to save lives and to reduce the burden on hospitals. You're seeing that in Texas and Florida, and you will probably see that in many other states. Interesting. Okay. So how important is it for President Trump to receive the vaccine in terms of building that critical public confidence? Well, I, 
I, of course, uh, think that the president should get a vaccine at the right time. 75 million people voted for him. Uh, he has devout followers, and I think it would set an example. I, I would say that there is a medical reason, and I don't know. I'm not his physician, so I don't know exactly right. But he did receive monoclonal antibodies within the last couple of months. Um, and there is a sort of, a, you know, guidance about waiting 60 to 90 days after a monoclonal antibody because it could interfere with the, uh, with the actual vaccine. But, of course, uh, uh, President Trump, for his own protection and to set an example for the 75 million people who voted for him, I think it's a great idea. Currently, the emergency authorization is for people at least 16 and older. What about younger children? Isn't that important in terms of getting them back to school? Well, um, we all, as a pediatrician, we certainly want to have the data to show that it's safe and effective in children. We don't have that yet. Um, uh, that is coming, though, 16 and above uh, for one vaccine, 18 and above for the Moderna vaccine. But I, I think it's very important for listeners to understand that getting children back to school right now is safe now. There's data upon data upon data that children could go back to school safely in person. There was a recent study uh, in the MMWR that said of all the places children are likely to turn positive, school is not one of them. Um, so it is safe and very important to get children back in school even before they are vaccinated. Now, with the community rates going down, we hope, after the holidays, because mm -hmm. we're seeing that trend right now, and with vaccines, it'll be even safer because there'll be less spread in the community. But children do not need a vaccine to go back to school safely. It's vital for their health to get them back physically present as soon as possible. What about their teachers? Should they be higher on the priority list in terms of vaccinations with millions of American parents worried their children are not learning in online school? Well, um, they're probably going to be higher on the list than the general public, but they certainly don't fall into the category of uh, the current ACIP recommendations or what's happening uh, in Texas or Florida and many other states. Um, young, healthy teachers should be at no more risk than young, healthy individuals in any other profession. So I would imagine that those, and they are critical infrastructure, we love our teachers, that they're going to be higher than the general public, but they're certainly not going to be in, in the next level on almost any state because they're not at higher risk, unless they are at higher risk, if they have hypertension or sickle cell disease or a cancer survivor or over 65, of course they go in that category, but otherwise they're probably going to be further down the priority scale because we need to take care of those who are vulnerable, who will die, who will be hospitalized first. And I think you're, you're seeing that both by the ACIP recommendations um, as well as by several states. It feels like we're waiting for the point when the United States gets to herd immunity. What's your current estimate? So um, herd immunity, when we get to herd immunity, um, that is when the pandemic is essentially over. Now, there could be pockets in certain places where there are uh, vaccine hesitancy and people don't get vaccinated. Um, the, the truth is nobody knows exactly the number, but based on mathematical models as we have it right now, it is somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of individuals having gotten the vaccine or having gotten a natural infection. Now, obviously, we want to develop herd immunity by people getting the vaccine uh, because they're at no risk of ill health effects or spreading it to other individuals. Somewhere in that 70 to 80 percent range is probably the sweet spot. Nobody knows for sure, but based on mathematical models, people kind of converge at that number. Admiral, we're running out of time, but final question, when do you expect that any American who wants a vaccine should be able to get the vaccine? Well, we are clearly on schedule. 20 million uh, vaccinations distributed uh, by the first week in January. We expect another 30 million in January, another 50 million in February. Um, and with the current contracts, even with just the vaccines we have right now, we still expect that any American who wants a vaccine can be vaccinated by June. That's really very exciting. That means a couple hundred million people being able to be vaccinated by that time. So um, with good mitigation steps, mm -hmm. with increasing vaccinations, particularly among the, uh, those who are vulnerable, we should see uh, clearly light at the end of the tunnel. But we've got to keep disciplined, got to keep vigilant right now as we vaccinate. Admiral, thank you for joining us. Thanks for your service. We wish you a happy and very healthy new year.